Okay, so so in th in this in this part we'll we'll dive deeper into uh, compression and hopefully see uh, finally see some new things. So <coughs> you remember the the information equals amortized communication theorem that we just saw. And I before I dive into the compression, I want to uh, I want to illustrate how this theorem and how in general the IC versus CC question. Uh, what is the motivation for this, uh, this question? So one of the primary motivations, in fact, part of what started information complexity in, in computer science is the so-called direct sum problem. So the direct sum question is a, is, is a general question uh, which you can essentially ask in, in any computational model about the scaling of the resources uh, for amortized uh, computation. And the general question is, is the following. So given a function f that requires c units, c resources for computing, so resources can be time, memory, uh, uh, space, anything you can imagine, what can we say about the com computational complexity of computing k-independent copies of this function? And so clearly we can always just run, we can always pay c resources per copy and pay, so you can always solve this using k times c resources. And the question is whether, is that, whether that's optimal. So can we do better than uh, this naive linear scaling of the, the resources? So even if we don't talk about error probability, can we beat this linear scaling of the resources for this k-fold computation? And the short answer is that is that, uh, well, the validity of this conjecture highly depends on the underlying computational model. So for example, uh, a well-known uh, counterexample to this conjecture is ve vector matrix multiplication. So it's easy to see that if we want to multiply an n by n matrix by an n-dimensional vector, we cannot do this be using be uh, fewer than n squared operations because we at least need to look at every entry of the matrix, right? But if we repeat this task n times, right, if k equals n, then what is this task becoming? It's just matrix multiplication, right? If we need to multiply an n by n matrix by an n-dimensional vector, if we repeat it n times, this can be viewed as just multiplying two matrices. And we know how to multiply two matrices using significantly less than n cubed. Right. But actually, there is no sheet. <laughs> so the, the way you know, the okay. way you explained it is that there's, there's, you can show by counting arguments that there's a fixed matrix A that's n by n that you can multiply with n bit vector that requires size n squared over log n. Uh, so that's, I guess because that was, the, okay. You had to say that there are n sure. matrix squared. Yeah. yeah so what I meant is, yeah, is that the, 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 the yeah, the matrix A is, is hardwired, and, and the input is just the vector. Just n bits. So you right, can't say that right. It's not obvious that there's, you require n squared size, but counting shows that there exists a new sure. that require n squared over log n size. I see. And now, if okay. you multiply A with an n bit, uh, you know, n, n by n matrix, you would expect it would take n squared over n cubed over log n size. Right. If you were naive, but you can actually do it n cubed. Yeah. Thanks, Anu. Right, right. I'm just. I'm, I'm just talking. I'm, I'm presenting the direct sum uh, uh, problem as first as just as an abstract question about an arbitrary computational model. I want to show. I want to convince you that this conjecture is not trivial. So there, there are cases in which it is true, and there are cases in which it is false. And we'll see what is the status of this conjecture. We'll explore this conjecture in the communication model in a second. I just want to convince you that. So what I like about this example is that there is no, you would expect that maybe you can get counter examples to this conjecture using concentration arguments or something. There is nothing, you're not using, the, the counter example here is, is real. It's not due to like concentration tricks or something. Uh, but really, this is just a, you know, this is just a, a um, kind of a side comment. Uh, and what we're really interested in is whether this conjecture holds in our care about communication model. So in the communication model, 
um, what is the direct sum problem in the communication model? Well, it's just what we talked about uh, last time. In this case, Alice and Bob receive k-fold inputs, where each copy is independently distributed according to some fixed distrib input distribution mu. And their goal is to compute the k-fold function f. Right? And the question is whether they can do this task whether w with using less than k times the communication required to solve a single copy of the function. Okay, so this question does not talk about information yet, at all, right? However, we just saw that we know precisely what this quantity is in the limit where k is, goes to infinity, right? For large enough k, we know that computing, we have the optimal protocol for computing k copies of a function, and the communication we need is exactly uh, k times the information cost of a single copy, right? So what I claim is that I presented a question here that does not involve information, but the previous talk convinces us that information is, is a very useful proxy for studying this question because this question, if you, if you recall the previous information equals amortized communication theorem, is exactly equivalent to whether a single copy uh, information, you know, uh, um, the, the single shot information cost is equal to the single shot communication cost. Okay, why is that? So, what I claim is that the direct sum, the strong direct sum uh, uh, conjecture holds if and only if the single shot communication cost is equal to roughly to the uh, single shot information cost. Does that make sense? Well, why is that true? Well, we just saw that the, the communication cost of solving k-independent inputs of a function is precisely, by the information equals amortized communication theorem, it's precisely k times the single copy information cost. And whether these two quantities are equal is exactly equivalent to the direct sum conjecture. Right. Right, right, right. I'm, I'm assuming, you know. So, in fact, let. Right. So. Right. So, sorry, I, I wasn't precise. Let Let me prove a more a more general statement. So, what I claim in. Right, so, so, so let me, maybe this will answer, let me state a, a stronger, a more general fact. So suppose we have, suppose, um, suppose we can take a protocol uh, for every, every communication co protocol pi which has information cost uh, i and communication cost. we can compress it and when I say compress I'll, I'll elaborate exactly what precisely what we mean but suppose we can simulate such a protocol using some number of some function of the information and communication resources so this would be the new suppose we, there's a general compression scheme that receives as an input a protocol with information, i bits of information and c bits of communication, and outputs, uh, basically, it compresses it into some quantity g, i, c of communication. Then I claim the following general relationship between the, the following gener generic direct sum result. Then I claim that um, again, I'm not using the error here, but assume that the error is third per copy.
Okay, and so what I claim is that we get the... <coughs> yes. Both of them are CC. Okay? And so what I claim is that we get a generic relationship between uh, the single copy communication cost and the k-fold copy. So let just to make things, suppose we can compress to order i bits, which is the best we can hope for, right? In this case, we will get that this thing is roughly equal to cc mu k f to the k over k. This will give us the optimal direct sum theorem. Does that make sense? So G, G is a, a compression is the, the amount of communication required for simulating an I bit information C bit communication protocol. So it's a what, what I claim is that suppose we have a generic compression scheme that given an I bit communication C bit uh, I bit information C bit communication protocol can output a, a simulating protocol that uses this much communication. Then we get the following uh, general direct sum. This is a, a generic relationship that shows you how compression results yield direct sum theorems. And so let's prove it. It's, it's really it's a one-line proof. I claim that after seeing the last 10 minutes of the previous talk, it's just a so I, I don't even need to, to write it. So suppose we have, so let, let, let us define by C, C sub K, the, the, the cost of the, the best amortized communication protocol for computing F to the K, right? Then we saw in the previous, the last 10 minutes of the, the talk, we saw that we can always use this protocol and to produce a single copy protocol for F that uses the same communication. The communication is horrible, is the, is the k-fold communication, right? So it will use C communication, but the information will be much better. It will be C over k, right? But now we're assuming we have a generic compression scheme that can take this, it's a legitimate uh, protocol for a single copy of, un, of F under mu. So we can always compress it, right? And so this is a legitimate, presumably assuming our, our assumption, this is a legitimate protocol that computes a single copy of F. So this is obviously... Right? So you all agree that this is an upper bound on the communication cost of a single protocol, right? Okay, Th that's it. That this finishes the proof. Okay, so this is a very uh, so this is just to to convince you that there is a really a, qual a quantitative relationship. The better we can compress the stronger direct sum theorem we get. And in the limit, if we can really get the optimal compression to i bits of communication, these two quantities are equal up to uh, a constant, which turns out to be false, but the ideal compression would get us the ideal direct sum theorem. Okay? So I will not dive into the importance of direct sum theorems in, in computational complexity. They have far-reaching consequences and I'll, I'll take this offline, but if you're convinced enough that uh, direct sum theorems are, are important, let's dive into, uh, uh, um, so having convinced you, hopefully, that this is an important question, let's see what, what, what can we do, uh, how well can we compress? What is the best G we, can, we, we, we have uh, today, or what is the best G we can hope for? Uh, 
counter example with uh, an ex uh, quite an exponential difference. So right. does this imply that somehow uh, the black uh, uh, strong reputation of the black song? Right. So very good point. So uh, uh, um, so last week Anoop showed us that. Uh, this, this equality is, is, is not true. In fact, uh, there are examples, and we'll see this in a second, where these two quantities differ, uh, are exponentially far apart. So this will refute the, direct, the strongest form of direct sum. But in fact, it still remains open. I mean, it turns out that it only refutes a very strong form of the direct sum theorem. It still leaves open. Uh, um, the possibility of, a, of an almost optimal direct sum theorem. Now, I'll, I'll get to this in a second. So, right, right. So, okay, th good question. So, uh, I o this theorem shows only one direction, right? The better you can compress, the stronger direct sum theorem you get. The 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 other direction, if you well, it really. If you define the interactive compression task uh, um, in a certain fashion, then you can, you can get essential equivalence. This is, if you view it as, yeah, you can define some pointer jumping, pointer chasing problem, and, and, and this, they become essentially, it really def depends on how do we define the interactive compression task. And for simplicity, I want, this is the way I want to define it. So, so okay, so so let me let me focus in this talk on on just uh, how do we obtain possibly weaker direct sum results using um, non-trivial compression schemes. Okay, so from this point on, in the next half hour, we'll just focus on on the interactive compression task, and let us define it uh, a little more formally. So the task is 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 quite simple. So uh, at least to define. <laughs> so Given a, we're we're given in the the goal is given an informa uh, a protocol pi, and an input distribution mu such that the information of this protocol is i bits and the communication is c, and you can think of c as being much much larger than i, like you know, it could be two to the two to the two to the i or whatever. And the goal is to simulate this protocol using an alternative protocol pi prime such that the statistical distribution or the statistical distribution on the leaves of the protocol is close in, let's say, in a constant statistical distance. So is the, is the problem well defined? Is, is, is everyone happy? <laughs> Sorry? Well, otherwise you can, the compression, you can compress using Zero. So you want two requirements. You want correctness. So you want to simulate the you want you want to simulate the functionality of the original protocol, right? Otherwise, you can compress using zero bits of communication, and you want to do that using uh, as few communication bits as possible. So pi is long. Pi is huge. C is huge, and pi is very is tiny. Right. So this is this function you can think of, yeah. Shared, shared random, right? so yeah. If you you can simulate an arbitrary long one with zero communication by just sampling and uh, <coughs> So but what but is the definition? Uh, so the goal you can even forget about this line. You're given a protocol which has tiny information I, yeah. huge communication C. And the goal is to sample a leaf of the original protocol or to simulate, just this is one way to define, or to simulate the original protocol in statistical distance using as few bits of communication as possible. So, we so this is protocol, Yeah. Let's look at Shannon's, uh, uh, at Huffman's compression as a special case, right? Right. Just that you, the simulating protocol of high prime has your shared messages and messages. The messages are short, that's the communication way. And then there's a function mapping high prime, the, the entire your shared randoms and the messages to a you know, simulated output. Mm -hmm. And the distribution of the simulated output to the original output uh, is close to L. 
Okay, I prefer, yeah, maybe I shouldn't write it on the board just because it will look more scary than what it actually is. So you can think of, so what, I, I suggest thinking about uh, Hoffman compression as a special case, right? We can always compress to the entropy up to, to, to one bit, let's say. And then given the, the message that Bob receives, he always has a function that basically decodes the original message, right? So. I agree. So let, I'll define this formally in a second. Basically, what Anoop just said. But let let me. So. Right. And, and, and actually. That's required by the definition of simulation to be defined. That's why I that's told. Right. Yeah, and in fact, this is why I told Leonard that uh, we, we actually, I prefer to think about this about the requirement of simulating the entire transcript, or in fact, sampling the, a leaf of the original protocol rather than just outputting the correct answer with high probability, because this is, it turns out that all compression schemes we have satisfy this stronger requirement. There's a good reason and And I'll, 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 I'll say this, something about this uh, in a second. So let me just say, say what is the plan for, for the next two. Uh, yeah, but that, that, that's a good uh, uh, point. So the two compression schemes I want to, to, to show during the talk today and, and, and tomorrow are uh, first the, the first one, which I'll actually present tomorrow, is uh, uh, compression to 2 to the i. So remember, ideally, we would like to compress to i bits of communication, or order i. The best we have is compression to uh, exponentially many bits in, in i. And turns out this is, um, yeah, so sorry, ignore this. This was from last week. So it turns out this, uh, this result is optimal if we insist on compressing only to a quantity that depends on i. And uh, as Peter just uh, said, this rules out the strongest possible form of a direct sum theorem. But what we really want to, at least for the direct sum application, it suffices to consider a more relaxed notion of compression, namely the one that appeared uh, on the board, where we allow the compressed uh, scheme to depend on the original uh, information, i, but possibly to, to depend weakly on the original communication, right? So if we can compress to something like polynomial in i and maybe logarithmically or maybe sublinearly in, in c, then we will make some progress. And this will immediately translate to a non-trivial direct sum theorem by, by the general relation we, we just saw. So the point is that I want to convince you that even a compression scheme that has some dependence on the original communication, which has, may be huge, a compression scheme uh, with a non-trivial or sublinear dependence on C is already making progress towards a, a direct sum theorem. And this is the regime of compression we will uh, care about. Of course, we will, lo we will look for a, a mild as possible dependence on, on, on C. Make sense? Yep. So 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 oh you want to consider a slightly perturbed input distribution? Yeah. Uh, so 
so you want to so you want to simulate uh, a distribution on, a, on on an input distribution which is not the original input distribution, but. I can I can say something offline about this later about an example where you slight perturbation of the input can lead to a, to a very a, s a simpler example. Okay, so we would like in this talk we would like to focus on this regime of compression or the general compression result, and what I would like to present is is a, is a talk is a, a compression scheme by Barack Braverman, Chen, and Rao, who proved that we can always simulate a, a protocol using the roughly the geometric, we can compress it to roughly the geometric mean of its information and communication. Okay, and I claim, so let me switch talks here. Uh, so we saw, um, yeah. Okay, so, okay, so let me, uh, uh, roll back for a second. So this is so our goal is to compress a protocol with i bits of information, c bits of communication, to s in some small statistical distance, uh, um, up to some small constant statistical distance. And uh, so yeah, before sorry, before I state Barack Braverman Chen and Rao's uh, result, let me say more formally what what we should think of as the sampling uh, uh, task. And this will be even more useful for, for tomorrow's uh, uh, compression scheme. So the way, I, one way to define the interactive compression scheme is, is the following. So first of all, assume that just throughout the, the rest of the tutorial, assume that each bit of the protocol, each message contains just one bit. So we can assume this up to, if we're willing to blow up the communication by a factor of two. We're compressing it. The communication is huge anyway, so we're willing to pay this price. And suppose we suppress the public randomness whatsoever. So in this case, each message, so each node of the protocol tree is associated with some um, player, Alice and Bob. And suppose this is a node owned by, by Bob. This is an even node. Then Bob has a probability of sending, given condition on the previous history and his input, he has a probability of sending either zero or one. This is over his private randomness. And, okay, so odd nodes are owned by Alice, even nodes are owned by Bob. And what is the interactive compression scheme? We want to sample a node. The goal is, so the point is that we have the protocol tree Alice has some probability distribution pi sub x because she sees her, her own input x. Bob has some input distribution pi sub y. And the goal is to, to just sample a, a node, to sample a node uh, um, or a transcript t, which is distributed according to the correct input distribution. Okay, and we'll see that this input distribution has some structure that allows us to, uh, to exploit it for, for certain, um, for we will exploit the structure of this distribution uh, in some specific way. But this, I want, throughout the talk, I want you to, to think of the interactive compression task as this task. So the goal is to output a, dist uh, a leaf which is up to an, you know, statistical distance, one-tenth, It's distributed as the a true input distribution, uh, the true distribution of, of the protocol, which is just uh, the true distribution of the, the transcript is just pi sub x, y. Make sense? So we are in high conditions. Right. So I'll, 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 each time I'm trying to be a little bit more formal, but not completely swamp you with details. So pi, pi of x, y is just, is 
So the true distribution of a of a t of a t bit t bit uh, um, transcript or t bit message is just defined as the I guess the probability that the protocol that it's this message conditioned on x and y. And of course, OK, yeah. And of course, conditioned on the public randomness and so forth. Okay, so this is the interactive compression task. And the goal is to just sample a leaf of this protocol. So the theorem I want to show you uh, in the next 20 minutes or so is uh, uh, the compression scheme of BBCR. It shows that this, remember this operator G of IC, it's at most, up to polylog factors, it's, most, it's at most the square root of the information and communication. What I claim is that this immediately produces, um, we just saw this theorem uh, uh, five minutes ago, and, sorry, and I claim that this immediately show, gives us a weaker direct sum with only a square root growth. Right? If you remember the theorem we wrote on the board a second ago, which is that theorem, you can always, BBCR produces such a function g, where g of ic is root ic, roughly. And this immediately yields a non-trivial uh, direct sum theorem. So this should convince you that really we're, we're making some progress. And I want to note that uh, this paper also has a, a highly non-trivial compression for product distributions, or Another way to say it is for, for the external information cost measure. We will not focus on this compression scheme, but um, you can do much better if the input distribution is a product distribution. Okay, so, so our goal throughout in the rest of the talk will be to prove this uh, uh, theorem. And so, so what is the high level approach? So you know, the most natural straightforward approach for compressing is just to try to compress each round of the communication at a time. So, <laughs> Good question. So it turns out they are somehow they're incomparable because it depends on how I relates to C, right? Yeah, but so, one but right. So I'm going to prove the root I C. Tomorrow morning we'll prove the two to the I. Okay. And it's clear that they are uncomparable, right? But we will in fact see cases in which one fails and the other succeeds. Okay. And um, Clearly, the two to the i compression is only useful when the information is very low. Once it's logarithmic in C, we're making no progress, right? So we, we, we will we'll see that, OK? Yeah, sorry for the confusion. OK, so our goal is to, to take a, a protocol with information i and communication C and simulate it using roughly square root i C communication. And the guiding intuition is that Instead of trying to compress the protocol round by round, uh, in which case we'll, we'll really, we'll, this, will this approach will kill us because if we're trying to compress round by round, we'll have to spend at least one bit per round, right? There's no way to communicate any information using less than one bit. And this additive one bit can really kill us if there are a lot of rounds, if there are, I don't know, square root n rounds. Therefore, the, the, the clever approach of BBCR is to try to avoid communication by trying to guess what the other player is about to, to, to say. And the intuition is that, well, if the information of the protocol is, is, is very low, then most of the time I can guess what, what Allison is about to say. If, if the information is, the typical information is small, then I will succeed in guessing what she is trying to say most of the time. Yes, what is about? So let's formalize what does it mean to guess that. So let me try to formalize this picture uh, here. So I want to define the following two quantities. I want to define what, does it, what, what is the view that Alice has in mind throughout the protocol, and what is the view that Bob has in mind. 
So for every node of the protocol tree, w, so what, what is a node w? It's just a, a sequence of the history of the messages up to layer i. So each such node is owned either by Alice or by Bob. Suppose this is an even node, so this is node is owned by, by Bob. So what is Alice's view of the world? What is Alice's belief on, on the next message? Well, she doesn't know it because she doesn't have Bob's input, right? So Bob is the speaker in this node. But she can still, she still has some vague idea about it, right? She has some prior distribution on it. What is this prior distribution? It's just the probability that Bob is going to transmit a zero given what she knows. What does she know? She has her own input and she knows the history of the protocol, right? This is a perfectly defined uh, uh, um, distribution. And this is the best guess that Alice, this is what I mean by guessing. This is the best guess that Alice has on what Bob is about to say. And for each such node, Bob has his own distribution, which is the same except he's conditioning on his own input, y, right? And so what I want you to, know, uh, to note is that in, each, in every even node, this is the right distribution. In every odd node, this is the correct distribution, right? And in fact, this is the structure I was alluding to of, of communication protocols. So what is this distribution that the players want to, to sample from? It's not just an arbitrary distribution, it has some specific structure. So the final distribution that the players want to sample from decomposes into this interleaved product distribution, right? We want to sample the first message according to Alice's distribution, the second message conditioned on the first message according to Bob's distribution, the third message according to Alice, the fourth according to Bob, and so forth. Does that make sense? Okay, and it, so this is, this is kind of the framework we'll be working on. And when I say Alice is trying to guess what Bob is doing, the natural thing for her to, to guess is to guess according to her prior distribution, uh, P, X, W. Okay, so instead of trying to compress round by round, the players will, will do the, the following thing. They will say, you know, the hell with compressing round by round. Let's just try to sample full paths. So I will sample a full path, and Allison will sample a full path. I have the correct distribution on odd nodes where I'm the speaker. And for, for nodes where she is speaking, I will just use my best estimate, my, my, my prior PXW for it. And she will do the same. And of course, some errors occur along the way. So the natural thing is to, to do is to search for these errors, correct them, correct them one by one, and continue recursively. So this will be the, the outline of the protocol. Does it make sense? We'll formalize everything, but this is the intuition. Okay, so it's, yeah. Uh, so, 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 so let's, let's be more formal about it. This, this was just uh, an intuition. So here, here's the, the most, the heart of the proof is the following primitive that allows the players to, to actually uh, uh, sample the, the to, so the, the crucial way, uh, point about the, the protocol is how to perform this, this guessing, or I hope this will answer uh, Peter's uh, question. So for each node of the protocol, the players will perform this, their guessing using the following approach. So for each node of the protocol, there are exponentially many nodes in the tree, right? They will do the following thing. So remember, each node, whether, suppose this is an Alice node, so this is an odd node. Each of this, these, these nodes is associated with two distribution. One is Alice's distribution, the black distribution. And one is the red distribution, Bob's distribution, right? And what the players will do, they will sample uh, using public randomness. So they will have absolutely no communication in this step. They will use public randomness to sample their, to, to, to perform their guesses. And the, the crucial point is that this approach will allow them to correlate their guesses. So, so here's how they do it formally. For each of those nodes in the protocol, they will sample a uniform number row between 0 and 1. And 
they will set it and, 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 and they will set their guesses as follows. So each player will set their next, the, their guess to the next message to be zero and one or one, depending on whether this random dart, this random uh, uh, error row, fell beyond their threshold. So if Alice has the, the black distribution P, X, W, she will set her guess to be one if and only if the, this random dart fell above her threshold, above the, the black point. And Bob will do the same. So let's call, let's denote by A sub W Alice's guess and by uh, um, B sub W Bob's guess. Right? So these are just the bits, zero and one, which the players uh, uh, think is about to be transmitted, conditioned on arriving at node W. So I want to make two very simple observations. So first of all, I claim that for any such node, the guess that the correct speaker, the owner of the node, has using this method is exact, has the precise, precisely the correct marginal distribution. Right, so what is the probability that a random number between zero and one exceeds the threshold of Alice? Or let's, let's put it another way. What's the probability that Alice is gonna transmit a zero? It's exactly this number, PXW, right? Which was by definition the probability, the correct probability with which Alice is sending a zero. So is everyone convinced that using this sample, Marginally, the players are sampling their guesses, 0, 1, exactly to the correct marginal distribution, PXW and PYW. The second thing I want you to be convinced is the players did not communicate anything. Everything here is done in their minds using public randomness. And finally, and the most important property, I want to claim that if these guesses are close to each other, if the information, intuitively, if the information revealed by the next message is small, then the players are likely to agree on their guesses. And you can see this, it's a proof by picture, essentially. So, so uh, yeah, so what is the probability that the players disagree? It's exactly the probability that this random number fell between their guesses, right? This is the only case which will lead to an inconsistency in the guesses, right? And what is this probability in terms of these input distributions? This is nothing else but the statistical distance between the distribution, right? This is just the absolute value of the difference between PXW and PYW. Okay, so let's summarize this results. So the marginal distributions of the guesses are correct. There is no communication. And we want to show that if the information, if these distributions are close to each other, then the error, the probability of a mistake is small. And indeed, the probability is exactly equal to the uh, absolute value of the difference between those, those uh, distributions. So far, so good. So up to this point, no communication, right? These are just everything is in the player's minds. So repeating this process for any node of the protocol tree gives rise to two, I guess, two objects, two trees two subtrees of the protocol tree, uh, pi sub a, these are corresponding to the guesses that Alice made, and pi sub b corresponding to the guesses that Bob made. And what I claim is that if you intersect these trees, if you take the guesses of Alice and you intersect them with Bob's guesses, this gives rise to a unique path which has the correct distribution by taking the odd nodes from the black tree and the, taking the even nodes from the red tree. Let's see a figurative example. So let's just illustrate what's going on here. So for each node of the, uh, of the tree, of the protocol tree, Alice has a, bl a black edge corresponding to her own guess, and Bob has a, a, a red edge, right? So for each node of the protocol tree, the players have this, these guesses. And remember, these edges are defined using the public randomness. There is no communication at this point. Okay, now what I claim is that, remember, the task is to sample the correct uh, leaf. 
which is in this case is, is, is this leaf. And I, I claim that this leaf is, is uniquely determined by taking the black edges from on even nodes and the, the red edges on, on, sorry, the black edges on odd nodes and the red edges on even nodes. And we can see how the protocol will proceed from this point. So the players will look for their first mistake, their first inconsistency. So the first, in the first step, they were lucky. They both guessed the, the correct consistent guesses. So they proceed to the next one. In the second uh, layer of the protocol, they're less lucky, right? Though, so they're a little bit uh, uh, less fortunate. They had a mistake. In this case, Bob is the owner of the second node. He's the owner of the even node, so he will, he will be responsible. They will correct the message according to his distribution, and they will proceed to the next node. Unfortunately, they made a mistake even on the third node as well. So now the correct owner of the, um, of the third layer is Alice, so they will correct according to her choices, right? Remember, on odd layers, we're following the black edges. On even layers, we're following the red edge edges. They have another mistake, so, so they're cons they'll correct it according to Alice's distribution. And they're lucky enough in the final node, so here they made the correct uh, guesses, and they will end up in the correct uh, leaf. Okay, so I claim that this defines the entire protocol. We didn't analyze it yet, but I, cl I claim that the correctness is, is almost by definition. So what, what, the the, what the players do is they make those guesses of, 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 of their respective uh, uh, subtrees. They look, they search, and they just recursively search for the first error that occurred, correct it according to the uh, first speakers, to the correct speaker, and recurse. Okay. Sorry. Uh, so I guess I'm, I'm not e entirely familiar with these approaches, but interactive, well, we have the experts. Yeah, I mean. Right. But uh, then what is there to, to compare to like that we don't understand? Well, how they, they have their own tree, right? Right. So, oh. so, so they compute all the, all the edges, in, in not, not only in yeah. some part, but all the edges are known everywhere. Yeah, yeah, and then what? And from this point out, they cannot avoid communicating. So from this point, after the guesses are made, now we, st we need to start communicating in order to find the errors we have to communicate to find the errors and then correct them one by one. So that they can start okay. the, and track all the errors everywhere and still they have some path because of this. There is, but you know, the, I understand that there is a correct path, right? But uh, the, in order to take no, the correct path, path, each of them has believed path. Yeah, so it, exactly. Each of them has exactly. Path. In, so in fact, each of them has a. Yeah. Do they believe in path, right? So that's why I want to say. Let's see. They, they generate, so, so, in this case, they generated a random In fact, they generated a, 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 an entire subtree. Which, in particular, the okay. So, the, the, the path that Bob's that Bob believes in to begin with is just the path obtained by following the red edges from root to leaf. Yeah. So he believes in. Let's say this was a red edge, so he believes in this path. But what do you call a subtree here on this picture? A subtree is just a collection of 
degree one outgoing uh, uh, edges from each node of the, the Oh yeah, yeah, but it's not okay. the sun. It's to you. Maybe it's a bad it's a bad it's word. It's a, ba yeah. it's a forest. Okay, so, you know, I mean, so, so essentially, you know, so when we say both players simulate something, <laughs> that means both players uh, generate a single path. Also, <laughs> exactly. one, one yeah. has What? Say, so one player, so here I say, so one player creates, so uh, one player just, uh, uh, they look at this tree and then one player just generates all the red edges in this, uh, tell, tell exactly. which, which edges are red. No, 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 one no, no, no. So no one is saying anything so far, they just look at the, <coughs> these numbers that they use to sample these red edges, and they just generate in their head a red tree and a red forest. A red forest. Okay, so... So each each player each player after using the public randomness for guessing, the status is as follows: each player has his own forest. Alice has the her black forest. Forest, forest, forest means just a set of edges. Right? A set of, of edges from one per node of the protocol tree. On both even level and odd level. Everything. It's a guess for each round. It's a guess for each round of the pro for each round and each for each potential path, right? From, for every node, yeah. okay, so the situation after this, uh, the yeah. first step is that for every node of the tree, for every node, yeah. we have an, uh, a guess that Alice makes for this node and a guess that Bob makes. Yeah. And I claim that this, in some sense, they have to, to, to do this because the path might end up there, right? Okay, so, okay, so. Their goal is to intersect, to yeah. so. I they have, they have to find it. Yeah. yeah. This is a view of any protocol. Yeah. Any protocol can do this. Yeah, you can. This is how many times we make mistakes. And, and, and we'll use this view tomorrow. When we'll see tomorrow the two to the I compression, we'll, we'll, we'll take this view also, but we'll use it and we'll exploit it in a different way. Well, okay, so, okay? Uh, so that now they have to communicate. Uh, right. Compare these two views. Okay. Right. So, okay, so this is exactly what we discussed. Okay, so eventually, so. But what is it that they actually communicate? So, what function of their edges do they communicate? So, good. So, so what, what, what they do is uh, they find, so all I need to describe, I claim that the only thing I need to describe at this point to define, to completely finish the definition, is how do they find the first mistake? Sure. Okay? So, is the notion of a mistake clear? Uh, so, a mistake occurs at level i. If the ad, let's, let's just look at it. Mistake is where the red path deviates from the black path. We say that a mistake occurs at level i, assuming that, assume, suppose hypothetically that we corrected everything, that everything is correct up to layer i. In this case, we say that a mistake occurs at level i if the outgoing guesses, if the, if the edges of the red, tree, the red forest and the black forest disagree in the i-th layer, okay? Is the notion of a mistake clear? So I claim that to finish the definition of the protocol, uh, all we need is to know how to find these mistakes. Because then I claim that everything is well defined. We just find the mistakes one by one and we correct them. But it's clear that the protocol will. You're not going to find mistakes in the whole tree, right? Somehow. No, no, no. That's the point. That, that's, remember, we made exponentially many guesses, but we correct each time we find a mistake. There's only a unique correct path. So uh, this will go through the analysis, right? It's like, you know, it's not even defining those mistakes. There are, there are places where the black disagrees, but there's only one path on which they can count those mistakes. Exactly. So you might be worried that you know, there are exponentially many nodes for which the players have guessed, uh, uh, made their guesses. But the point is that we're only traversing a unique path. So I will show you my induction that we're we're only going to consider a small number of them, namely one per, per layer. So the number of mistakes will be always upper bounded by C, by the depth of the communication, always. That will, it, this will be clear in a second. So actually, I want a small leap of faith. I want you to believe me that in order to compute where a mistake has occurred, 
this is equivalent to the task of comparing two C-bit strings and finding the first difference between them. Does everyone agree? So, okay. I, so I'm trying to describe what is the communication protocol for finding the first mistake that occurred. I claim that this task is equivalent to finding the first deferring index among two n-bit strings. Alice has her own, um, her own uh, uh, guest path, which is obtained by her tree. Bob has his own obtained path. These are just C-bit strings, binary bit strings. And they need to find the first def deferring index. That's it. I claim that this task can be done, this is a highly non-trivial protocol, using uh, uh, log C bits. If the, if, if there's, so finding the first difference uh, in, a two, in two C bit strings can be done using uh, log over epsilon bits of communication if you're willing to tolerate some error. I want to stress that this is a harder task than just comparing which one is larger. And so this is a not actually not a trivial protocol, but, uh, See, but it's, not it's not, I mean, <laughs> it's not. It's Yeah. Yeah. Right. So th this protocol does those hashing in a more yeah in a clever more clever way. I see, to analyze. What, what do you know that's more about? No, you have the some. Distribution the distribution is not arbitrary, right? Yeah, these are not arbitrary strings. Uh, and a, a lot of the, even if Alice, say, goes on a different path, and Bob, they don't have Yeah, I, I guess uh, what the guy's saying is that if, if, the, if the distribution on X and Y was, if they were independent uniform strings, then finding the first differences can be done very cheaply. And he's right, so the, the point is that the joint distribution is, there are hard distribu there are distributions on which you can solve those, this task using fewer bits, but I don't know how to, to exploit this fact, so. Okay, so if you believe this, I claim that this finishes the entire protocol. And so what the players do is they, so they set epsilon to be small enough so that they can union bound over the probability error of this protocol throughout the rounds, and this is it. So what they do is they just run this protocol to iteratively find the next mistake. They correct them one by one, and they end up, by definition, by construction, they, they end up in a correct leaf of the protocol. So correctness hopefully is undoubted, right? The only thing that remains is to analyze how many, how, how, you know, how, what is the communication of this protocol. And it should be fairly straightforward that uh, it's in fact a corollary of, uh, corollary of, of this uh, uh, argument is that the expected communication of the protocol up to this log factor is exactly the expected number of mistakes that occurred, right? So though we are not quite done, you, you really, you have to appre uh, appreciate the simplicity of this, of this analysis, right? We, we did something uh, not, not so trivial, but the, the, the analysis is, is quite, 
simple. All we need to calculate is the expected number of mistakes that the protocol makes. But how do you relate the number of mistakes with the month before the first one? They are not somehow in the distribution. So this is, let's finish the proof. So let's, so the main, the heart of the proof is showing that the expected number of mistakes is uh, upper bounded by square root of the information times the communication of the protocol. Okay? And so on the one mistake, but this happens usually very early. Uh, sh so we'll actually show that, so the intuition is that the expected, no for every round, the expected, the, the probability of making a mistake in round i, we would want to relate it to the information of the ith message. And the intuition is that if the information in, in node i is, is low, so on, on average, Allison reveals little information, I w our guesses will, will, we are very unlikely to make a mistake on this, on this node. And I want to use just one fact, which is, um, okay, so I think I'm running out of time. So I will assume Pinsker's inequality here, which, which basically says that, um, Maybe I have it here. Yeah, I have it. So all we'll use are, are uh, I will only use two facts. So the first one is that the statistical distance between any two distributions is upper bounded by square root of their KL divergence. And there's a constant. Right, but I will, I will not care about it. <laughs> Thanks, I'm trying to make uh, things as simple as possible. And if we let epsilon i denote uh, the random variable, which is one, the indicator of a mistake at layer i, then, um, okay, so, sorry, so let's, w w let's denote by epsilon i the, the indicator of, uh, of the event of a mistake occurring at layer i. And the second fact we'll use is, is what we showed in the beginning of the, the, the talk, <coughs> is that uh, um, if i is an odd node, then conditioning, then the, the, the probability distribution on the next message, if i is an odd node, is only a function of Alice's input in the history of the protocol. So we may, we may as well condition on Bob's input distribution. It will not change anything. This is another way of saying that communication protocols form a Markov chain with respect to uh, uh, when we condition on the history of the protocol. Okay, so we defined uh, epsilon i to be the indicator of a mistake at layer i. And so what I want to show you is that um, the expected, the expectation of epsilon i, right, it's, it's some number between zero and one. I want to show that, I want to relate the, expec the expected, the expectation of epsilon i to the information that the message i reveals, right? Because the expected number of mistakes is just, by linearity of expectations, it's just the, expe the sum of those expectations. All right? Okay, so, so this will be the final slide of the, the analysis. Try to, to stay tuned. So by definition, what is, what is the probability we make a mistake? It's the probability that it's the event that Alice's guess is different than Bob's guess. We just saw that using our correlated sampling approach, this, the probability of making a mistake is exactly the uh, absolute difference of the prior distributions, right? So this is just the definition of the prior distributions, right? This is ju I'm just replacing, substituting uh, these notions with the formal definitions. We can now use the Markov uh, property of protocol. So suppose that I is an odd node, we can always plug in Bob's distribution, y. This will not change anything. Feel free to interrupt if you, f if you feel that uncomfortable with any, uh, uh, an anything. And here comes the, the main step. So we want, to upper, we want to relate the statistical error between Alice's, between Bob's, uh, Alice's uh, uh, prior distribution, which is the correct distribution in this case, and Bob's prior distribution. And here we're using Pinsker's inequality, and this is at most square root of the KL divergence between Alice's message distribution and Bob's prior distribution. 
So far, so good. What I claim, and this is, I, I, I did not, I guess I should have argued this fact in the beginning of the tutorial. I claim that this is equivalent, this expression is equivalent precisely to the mutual information between, basically the information that the ith message conveys on Alice's input to the receiver, to Bob with input y, conditioned on the history. Okay, so how many are familiar with the connection between, anyway, the, do you, do you want me, I, I'm, I can elaborate on this connection, but this is, this is, a, this is a just by definition, um, the information, okay, sorry. So before we do that, just one more step. We use the concavity of the square root function. This is upper bounded by square root of the expectation. And now we'll use the chain rule for either for divergence or for Sorry, no chain rule yet, sorry. <laughs> sorry, so we're just using the concavity of square root, and I claim that this expectation is precisely the definition of the mutual information, the information that message I conveys on Alice's input X, conditioned on the history in Bob's input. So this is exactly the internal information cost of the message, the ith message. Make sense? Okay, so I claim that we're essentially done. To finish the proof, we just count the expected number of mistakes by linearity of expectation. This is the sum of the expectations. We saw that each expectation term, each term is upper bounded by square root, the mutual information. And I can always add the other term, right? It, one of those terms will be zero because Alice only learns information when she listens, not when she speaks. So I can always add these two terms. Using Cauchy-Schwarz, we can always upper bound this term by square root of the product of the sum of the squares of each term, right? And so here we have a summation over C random variables because the depth of the protocol is C, so this will evaluate to C. And this is just using the chain rule. This is precisely the information cost of the protocol. All right? So this finishes the, the, the proof. A last remark. So is everyone happy with the, the analysis? Great. So we, we proved that we can always compress to I, a square root of i times c times polylog factors. I just want to, so the natural question is whether, you know, one could ask is whether this analysis is tight. And we saw these, these places where we could potentially be loose, this Pinsker's inequality step and this Cauchy-Schwarz step. And unfortunately, I just want to conclude with the following counterexample, which shows you that unfortunately this analysis is tight. So considering, consider the following uh, 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 simple protocol in which Alice has a uniform n-bit string, and the protocol is the following simple protocol. In each, in each step, Alice sends an epsilon biased version of her ith bit. So in each step, if her input is one in the ith bit, then she sends an epsilon biased coin towards heads, and otherwise she sends um, an epsilon bias coin towards uh, uh, tails. Then, and, and we set epsilon to be uh, one over square root the input length, or one, one over square root the communication length. So is the protocol uh, clear? So all the protocol does is Alice keeps sending independent, with independent randomness, she just sends the ith bit in order. What I claim is that it's not a, it's a pretty easy uh, calculation that in this case, Pinsker's inequality is tight. So the information that Bob learns from each bit is actually order of epsilon squared bits of information. Even though statistically speaking, Bob's prior distribution was half-half. So statistically speaking, his guess in Alice's true distribution is only theta of epsilon far apart. But the divergence is on the order of epsilon squared. Uh, 
sure, I'm not saying, I, I'm just saying that the analysis is tight. What Klim is saying that, of course, in this case, we can use a different method to, 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 to compress, but I'm saying that the BBCR analysis we just saw is tight, for, is not going to be appealing in, in this sense, because if you believe that each message conveys epsilon squared bits of information, we set epsilon to be 1 over square root n, then the total information cost of the protocol is only, let's say, 5 bits of information or so. It's a constant. On the other hand, the statistical distribution, I, I claim that the number of mistakes here will be huge. It will be of the order root n, square root n. Why? Because the statistical distribution, which is the probability of making a mistake in step i, scales as the statistical distance between these uh, uh, distributions, Bob's prior analysis, true distribution, this is on the order of epsilon. Therefore, we will make omega of n times epsilon, which is root n mistakes. Right? But still, as Klim says, it seems that it seems a little bit, you know, too bad, right? It seems like in this case we can actually do better. After all, the information conveyed in this protocol is, is, is constant. And tomorrow morning we'll see a, 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 the compression to a compression scheme that, at least in this regime, where, when information is really, really small, we can actually do better. We, we have a regime that compresses into 2 to the i bits. So in, at least in this ex bad example, this, this compression scheme will do better. So let me finish here and we'll, we'll continue tomorrow. Yeah. Thanks.